And let's bring an emergency physician and ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Darian Sutton, now for more on this vaccine. Dr. Sutton, good morning. You know, we just saw how uh, some of the airlines will be transporting, in this case, United will be transporting those vaccines. These are extremely cold temperatures. So Kim on Twitter wants to know if the places that administer the vaccine are prepared to keep them at these super low temperatures. Yes, great question. So good morning, Diane. So the answer is most likely uh, larger hospitals are more capable of holding these vaccines at significantly lower temperatures. I think the limiting factor will be on small, smaller hospitals, more likely in rural areas, uh, at having capacity to hold the Pfizer vaccine at such low temperatures. And that might create a situation where the Moderna vaccine, for example, which can be held at higher temperatures, is shipped to these areas and the Pfizer vaccine is shipped to areas that has a high level of turnover and more capacity. And then what happens when it actually gets injected? Is it still that cold? <laughs> Great question. So before the vaccine is injected, it is pulled out of the freezer and it is thawed. Now, this is a crucial point because the Pfizer vaccine can stay thawed for five days, but the Moderna vaccine can stay thawed for up to 30 days. And so that really makes a difference in their shelf life. So it is not still frozen once it is <laughs> used. Um, it is thawed before it's used. Got it. And uh, another question from Twitter. Luke asks, if we could create the COVID-19 vaccine this safely, so quickly, then why don't we always do it this way? This is, so this is a question of um, whether or not it's being rushed or too fast. And, and I hear this question. I think it's important to talk about how this process is done. So number one, the mRNA vaccine is a brand new technology, but not as new as people may think it is. It is not just developed this year. This technology has been researched since as early as 2003 during the SARS outbreak. Um, the differences between this type of vaccine and other vaccines are number one, this is built in a lab. Number two, this is not needed to be grown as other vaccines are, which takes a significant amount of time. Also, vaccine research is usually limited by two main things, which is funding and cases. With the federal funding provided by programs such as Operation Warp Speed and the amount of cases that are simply available, given the fact that this virus is so widespread, it has created a good environment to produce and prioritize this vaccine, but it is not rushed. It's a great explanation, Dr. Sutton. Thank you. And, and how much harder do you think it will be to vaccinate the general public as opposed to that first wave of frontline workers and people in long-term care facilities. So this is a tall operational feat that is going to take a tremendous amount of public health education. If you look at the uptake and use of um, flu vaccines, for example, in the last 10 years, as reported by the CDC, the average amount of use is about 45% among adults. And uh, as I stated before, the goal is to get approximately 60% of the American population to use this vaccine. So it's going to take a lot of education, a lot of transparency, and a lot of confidence that needs to be instilled in the public. And President-elect Joe Biden says he's asking people to wear a mask for 100 days when he takes office. How much of an impact could that make? A tremendous impact. Uh, many analysts and scientists and epidemiologists predict that if we were all to wear masks, at least 95%, we could save up to 130,000 lives by just doing that simple feat. So I think it's a great recommendation. I think it's necessary. And I get so many questions on Twitter about the mortality rate. The COVID mortality rate across age groups is under 1%. So how do you respond to people who look at that low death rate and think it's not that big a deal or it's low risk to gather and not wear a mask and take precautions like that? I get the same question from patients and friends, and I think that the answer is, is how are you calculating that? So when you're referencing that number, most likely people are referencing the mortality rate, which is a number of the virus and the deaths from that virus compared to the general population. A better number to look at is some numbers such as the case fatality rate or the infection fatality rate. And this looks at those who are infected and those who die from the infection. And that number is significantly higher. And that is the reason why our hospitals are reaching capacity and we're reaching a true crisis. Because although the majority of people will have relatively good symptoms and not have to require hospital intervention, 25% of those people will require hospital intervention or possible hospitalization. And that's where those death rates increase significantly. So that's why we're having this problem. All right, Dr. Darian Sutton, we appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, if you have questions about COVID-19, you can tweet them to me at Diane Armacedo. We will answer as many as we can right here on the air. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.